All right, good morning, everyone. And welcome to our webinar on HR audits, the good, the bad, the ugly. It's an enticing uh, title and I'm telling you, we have some amazing presenters here with us today. Um, just a few you know, things to go over before we begin. Uh, this webinar is brought to you by JER HR Group and our trainery brand solutions. JER HR Group is a national human resources firm with over 30 years of experience providing compensation consulting, employee learning, organizational development consulting, and HR services and support for 300 plus clients nationwide. Our team of staffing consultants work collaboratively with our clients to develop and provide customized solutions that align with clients' needs and strategies. And our trainery brand solutions offer a suite of products for e-learning, workforce training, talent management, and that help HR departments to optimize employee skill sets, knowledge, productivity, employee experience. And if you're interested in that, you'll be able to see more information on how to contact with us at the end of this. Um, so our, presenter our presenters today, we have Miss Jada Willis. Uh, Jada Willis comes to us originally from Willis HR. She is now with, J with JER HR Group as a people strategy advisor. Um, when she was with Will J Willis HR, they were voted as best HR benefits company in South Carolina. She is widely considered as a thought leader in leadership development and transforming company culture. She is the host of the international podcast, HR After Dark, and Jada Willis experience. Um, so she brings over 18 plus years experience in HR and uh, she brings, let's see, she has worked with, what is it, SMB? Is it SMBs? Did I say that right? And Fortune 100 companies? I'm sorry, I stumbled over that one. You can correct me if I'm wrong, Jada. And then uh, we have Miss Rebecca. She goes by Becky Page. She is an expert in HR management, benefits and safety administration, finance recruitment and selection, compensation management, training and development, employee coaching, and strategic planning. She's the former president of HRP and a widely recognized expert in human resources. So you guys have some amazing experts today that are going to be leading this presentation on HR audits. And I'm going to hand this over to them so that they can get you started. Um, I do just a few housekeeping things. Um, one, if you want to change the orientation of your screen, there's going to be three little dots at the bottom where you can change your layout. Um, you can just take a little click right there and you can move us around. Um, two, we're going to reserve all questions for the end of the webinar. We're going to have a Q&A at the end. Feel free during the webinar to put them in the Q&A slot uh, throughout it, and we're going to filter through all of those towards the end so that Becky and Jada can go through them all. All right, you guys take it away. Great. Um, good morning. Happy Friday, everybody. I just want to take another quick second second to say thank you for your attendance. We all know how valuable time is, so we really appreciate it. As Kayla mentioned, my name is Becky Page, and I'm currently the Director of HR Services at JER HR Group. I've been in um, human resources for 30 years, so I hope there's not a bunch of mathematicians out there. Um, and I did own my own company, uh, consulting company, for 20 years. And I just want to let you know that I'm very, very passionate about HR education, support, guidance for all types of companies and sizes and industries. So I'm going to let Jada expand a little bit on herself. Thanks so much. Sorry, I couldn't got, get off mute there. Um, no, so thankful. I want to echo what uh, Kayla and, and Becky have already shared as well. We're just so thankful that you've taken the opportunity um, to join us today on a Friday. Who doesn't want to talk about HR audits on a Friday? Come on, like this is good stuff. Um, but I have a true passion uh, for compliance and culture, and I love bridging the gaps uh, for honestly businesses of all sizes. Um, and so I'm just excited to share this information with you today and then be able to answer any questions that, that you may have as well. So thank you for that. Great. 
So we are co-presenting today. I'm going to be doing the first half and then Jada will be doing the second half. And we are gonna turn off our cameras during the presentation. So like Kayla said, if you have any questions that come up, please make sure you put them in um, the Q&A and we'll do the Q&A at the end of the session. So, so we're gonna start off with the agenda. Um, we're gonna talk about goals and objectives of an HR audit you know, how the audit process really kind of works. And then the four distinct stages of the employment relationship. We always find it's kind of um, easier to understand when you um, kind of lump everything together in certain, um, just certain buckets. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So the name and the title of the audit was the good, bad and the ugly. And we are going to start off with the ugly and the bad, but then we're going to move right on to the good. So the first bullet under ugly, it says 30% of organizations have been sued by an employee in the last 12 months and the trend appears to be increasing. So I try to just want you to imagine sitting in a networking room of 10 people and you look around and think, okay, what, what employers could possibly be in that 30%? And What's interesting when I say the statistic, I have uh, employers tell me like, Becky, I don't know anybody that's ever been sued by an employee. And I can tell you employers that have been sued by employees do not want to share that information. So um, it is happening, we hear about it. So it just kind of the feedback that I get. Also the EEOC and everybody, it's called the equal, um, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Now that government division, which is federally, is responsible for enforcing uh, federal discrimination laws. And they have a press release page. And in preparation for this webinar this morning, I just kind of went through their you know, press release page and just kind of went through the last six weeks. And they have cases against employers all over the country. And I just want to name a couple cities that jumped out at me. There was one in Greensboro, one in Rochester, New York, one in Greenville, South Carolina, one in Boulder, Colorado. The industries, industries varied from um, restaurant to IT to total, title loan company. So um, if you think you're in an industry that, that really doesn't have much exposure, it's really all over the show. So the next bullet is 60% of wrongful retaliation, which is the number one complaint in almost every state and termination cases in court are won by the employee. So what retaliation means is that an employer has punished an employee for exercising their workplace rights. So there's a many actions that an employer can take to reduce and kind of avoid you know, the potential of being sued. But I do wanna give you a tip and it's for a whole nother webinar, but it's really, really important. And I know people that have listened to prior webinars of mine that Anytime there's any type of challenge, you need to document, document, document. It's really gonna, um, really gonna help. So, and then on the right, let's kind of go over the bad. Um, voluntary turnover expected to reach 35% in 2023. This is according to research from the Work Institute. Now, some industries right now are higher than that, but when we combine all industries, it is definitely increasing. And I really suggest that you uh, track your turnover. I think it's a really good um, statistic to be able to see at least annually, or you could do it biannually, and you can do it by department. So you can look at those statistics and say, you know, is it, is it one particular department? You know, what were we doing last year versus this year? So that's one thing I encourage you to do. And the potential risks of an employee claim includes, you know, state and federal fines, back pay, lawyer costs, loss of productivity, you know, rep reputation damage. You know, one thing I want to say about, about this is that um, your time too. It, it's unbelievable, just one EEOC claim, the amount of time that it takes to respond. And, you know, I owned a HR consulting company, as I mentioned, you know, for 20 years. And you know, I would go those nights I go to bed and it was like, I don't know what I don't know, you know, and I finally took my own advice and I'd have to seek out expert advice. So we do hear that from the clients. And, you know, as most of you know, rules and regulations around the function of HR has really increased dramatically. And so that just also increases your company liability. 
Also, we see a lot of misconceptions still. Uh, we actually have done employee handbooks where a company has a policy that says employees cannot share their wage. Um, that policy is illegal under the federal government, and there's many, many states that even have their own, um, their own state law. So not only would you violate a federal law, you could violate a state law, which means the employee would actually have two avenues in which to you know, file a complaint, both for through the feds and the state. So, so that's kind of wrapping up the ugly and the bad, but let's move to the good. Next, yeah, great. So companies that embrace HR practices see better morale, improved productivity, increased employee retention. After an extensive research by Oxford University, happy employees are 13% more productive than unhappy. And for employees in sales, boosting happiness can increase closed deals by 37%. You know, I've been in HR a long time. And what's interesting is there are a lot of studies now, and it's so great to be, you know, in the way early days, it was like, well, how are you measuring this? And there's many, many studies that now show you're able to, you know, measure the human resource function and its impact on the financial bottom line. So um, studies also include that the most employment lawsuits are tracked to the four distinct stages of employment which Jada is going to cover. So this is a perfect segue into um, those areas and kind of how the audit relates to looking at those areas. So some questions I just want to throw out, you know, do you know what's in your handbook? One thing is, you know, do your managers know what's in the handbook? You know, do you know, you want to think things, do you know what questions your managers are asking in interviews? So all of this stuff, as we gain information in the audit process, we're able to answer a lot of those questions. So the main thing about um, the ugly and the bad um, is that if you're inconsistent, what happens is it provides a perception and the employees just feel like there's something amiss. So you're kind of exposing yourself a little bit. Once you have your HR processes, you know, um, the practice is down, you're very consistent, your liability is going to drop dramatically. So let's move on to all the objectives and goals of the audit. So here you'll see it says an HR audit is an objective examination of your business policies, practices, and procedures. So the goal is, is to identify strengths and weaknesses within those areas implement improvements and address the weakness and out of compliance practices. And what it really gives you is a valuable feedback and a roadmap. So we've had clients that literally had an audit and then they had a three year plan. And I think that's one thing I kind of want to address. I know that audit, I always said maybe should be a four letter word because I don't like audits, <laughs> but they are necessary. And, um, you know, the way you can think about it is that Yes, you can address the immediate, but you can do a game plan to be able to address all, you know, all the sections that are identified. So I always don't want employers to hesitate thinking, oh my gosh, you know, they're going to give me, you know, I'm going to have to have all this work. I'm not have time for this work. So that's what, you know, that's what we're here for, you know, through the audit. So um, now we're going to move to a poll slide and we're going to do a poll. So the first question is, first and only question, how often do you conduct internal HR audits? And Kayla, do you want to let them know where? Oh, yeah. We have Sorry, new platform. <laughs> no, that's OK. Uh, everyone's uh, voting right now. Let's see. Awesome. Thank you guys for putting in your votes. We got about half of the votes coming in. Should have popped up on your screen. I'm going to give you guys just a minute.
Awesome. It looks like about, it looks like almost everybody voted, so I'm going to go ahead and publish those results. Can you see those there, Becky? Yep. All right. If you click results under the polls, we're looking like 44% voted annually, 36% never, 9% every six months, and 9% what is an HR audit. So that's great, great feedback. So we're going to hit all avenues of people that have, you know, that do it annually and you'll be able to see, are you covering everything you need? Um, and what the benefits may be to have an external um, company do your actual audit and in the results. So thank you everybody for your feedback. I think that's, um, it's great. We're hitting everybody that wants to know what it is, people that are doing it annually and, you know, every six months and never. So I'm wrapping up my portion. I want to turn it over to Jada, who's going to be the dynamic presenter, <laughs> and uh, we'll let her take it from here. All right, next slide. And no pressure, Becky. Come on. So that was, <laughs> that was a, a, a perfect segue and introduction. Um, and really just thinking about, okay, how does this HR audit work, right? What is it? What should be included? That sort of thing. So here's bare minimum. I know that we're going to eliminate option D from the poll of what is an HR audit. I know very sure that we're going to cover that. So um, just in looking at this, I, I want to give you my response to, to that poll as well. Typically, I recommend at least an annual HR audit to be conducted. And again, that's coming from me having 18 plus years of experience. And I say at least because it really is also based off of the organization. It's also based on how often, when did you start conducting the internal audits? And, and some of you may even say, hey, like, come on, Jada, there can't be that much that has changed, you know, with employee files. The one thing I want to caution you on is as we go through the basics and because there are there is a framework and there are basics included into an, an, an HR audit, don't take those for granted. Right. So those are also areas in which you don't know if there have been compliance updates or you feel like you know, in, in clients have come to me and said, oh, no, 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 we got that covered. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we have an employee handbook. But the questions are, is it updated? Is it compliant from a state and federal perspective? And does it even relate to um, the culture and, and some of the HR pieces that you have on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So, but don't worry, we will cover the, the basics of an internal audit in just a few minutes. But I also wanna say that there are two important factors uh, to consider because you can customize your audit. And I'll explain that in just a moment. But the two important factors, one, what are the hot topics that government agencies are focused on? So whenever you're thinking about um, just, yes, you're gonna have your list of uh, basic items to include, but what do you know that from a government agency perspective um, are the recent court cases? And that's how you identify the trends. So right now, let me give you some examples. Misclassification of exempt and non-exempt employees, um, overtime, anything in re related to pay practices, I'm telling you, that is hot right now. And I'm one of those nerds that I check HR blogs probably on a daily basis. I don't know if I should share that for my reputation, but, um, it's, it's just a passion of mine to see what is trending. And you can obviously start thinking about how does that relate to, to my organization? And the next piece is, so that's number two, what business concerns are you experiencing? So think through it like this. So are you struggling with recruiting talented employees? So like this is just one example, but, and then think about, have you conducted a compensation and benchmarking study to see how your pay is? Is it competitive in your industry? Is it competitive geographically? Um, so whenever you start looking at some of the root challenges that you have in your HR practices, whether it's recruiting, whether it's retaining employees, what can you do in conducting your audit to look internally to your HR best practices? So this is, I'm going to emphasize, this is an addition to the basic list um, that's included in an audit. 
All right. And one thing I'm really proud about from a, a JER perspective is that we have 90 days to HR health. So that means that we know what's going to be automatically thought of, included, considered those basics, and it's going to be tailored to state and federal federal laws, also to the organization, total employee size. And we do that discovery process of what are some of the goals, business goals, initiatives? Um, are we growing? Are we scaling? And, and all of that's included. But I would say this, if you are conducting the audit yourself, be thinking about the system that you are going to have to conduct this audit. So how are you going to record the data? What are you going to look for? How are you going to track or analyze? So evaluate. Yes, I'm compliant. No, I'm not. And what do you do next? And then always, no matter if it's it's us doing it from an HR audit outsource perspective or you're doing it internally, make sure you have the HR audit report. I mean, you're going through all of this work effort. Uh, make sure that you have the report that indicates um, what the results are, but then also the action steps that's included. How are you going to remediate these issues? So we're looking at those, those basic list of areas. I keep hinting towards it, so let me just give it to you. Things to think about. So of course included are your employee files. And that means how many employee files do you have? What are they for? Where are they located? Are they in the, the properly stored locations? Um, I-9s from an accuracy perspective, are they completed for each employee? New hire reporting, employee handbooks, job descriptions, harassment-free workplace training, employment posters. That's like very basic, uh, bare bones when it comes to conducting an HR audit. Now, some other tips in conducting an audit are, you can choose to actually do a random selection. So whenever it comes to your employee files, let's just say you have 200 employees. Well, if you randomly select employees, maybe with different job tenure um, in different departments, then you are going to get that random snapshot of, are, are your processes in place? Are the I-9s accurate? Are your employee files being you know, stored correctly? But if you do an entire all employee audit, then I mean, and at least you know, you know exactly what the results are and it, it's not just that random selection. I'm not pointing you to either one. I, I would say that both are better than not conducting an audit at all. And then in addition to this, setting the timeline. So notifying any parties that need to be included. So whether it's accounting partners, bookkeepers, uh, things of that nature, but setting that timeline in place and being realistic because you are still you know, conducting your additional job duties. Now, if you outsource it, of course, we're gonna give you that project timeline and, and tell you what's included. How are you documenting? And you're gonna hear that a lot. And now if you signed up for an HR webinar, the one thing you know you're gonna hear is about documentation and Becky mentioned, mentioned it too, and tracking findings. So, and then preparing your HR audit report with action steps. That's an important piece. How are you going to mediate these issues that you've now identified and who's included in that? Now, of course, I'm gonna emphasize this again. It's really important that you also document that you've conducted this internal HR audit. One example is if you're doing an employee file or I-9 audit, and this is just a tip, make sure that you're putting even this blank page uh, where you've entered in the fact that you've conducted the audit, who conducted the audit, so whether it's an outsourced group or, or yourself, and what are the ne next action steps to occur. I'm telling you, it goes a long way that if you actually receive uh, an outside audit uh, from a government agency, um, it, will, it will be in your favor that you have been intentionally uh, trying to correct any sort of compliance issues. All right, next slide. Next slide. All right, there we go. Took a little time. So um, whenever we're thinking through this lens, right, we're thinking about um, the four distinct stages of an employment relationship. And that's the easiest way to break down also the audit process. You think about the employee life cycle. What we say at JER is from hire to retire. That's where we're here to support you. And it, and if an employee does initiate any sort of legal action, it, it may be that your defense is actually found in one of these four categories, if you're also doing it correctly and obviously maintaining standards of compliance. So we're going to break down and go through each of these, and uh, I'm going to discuss hiring, onboarding, training, and managing. And you may think, wait a second, Jada, what about terminating? Terminating will be included under the, um, the managing aspects as well. Next slide. 
All right. So in the hiring of employees, so we know that inconsistent hiring practices may create financial, legal exposure, and, and really just internally, it may impact just turnover, employee retention, a myriad of other issues, um, but ultimately exposing some compliance violations as well. Um, just so you know that financial exposure for discriminatory hiring practices, uh, if, if that is the result, it may include back pay, front pay, civil penalties, punitive damages, attorney court fees, and other penalties. And like Becky said, time. Oh my goodness, the amount of time and energy you are going to spend on this and disruption to your workforce, uh, that's, that's the intangible that really is, is also quite costly. One thing I noticed in one of the, the blogs, I think I found it on hrdive.com, that the EEOC alleges that Olive Garden violated the ADA by asking illegal questions. And one of the managers asked a candidate that, was, that came in for an interview with a cane about the cane, about their disability, even about you know, work accommodations. And ultimately, Olive Garden refused to hire this individual. Now, as, uh, as I, you can imagine, uh, that is a concern. So if we just take this from an HR audit lens, I'd say, wow, we need to look at, are interview guides legally defensible? Are they consistent? Also, are we doing behavioral-based interviewing? And are we training our leaders on how to conduct legally compliant interviews? Now, you may, you know, you may say this is, this is a bit of common sense, but the amount of issues that we experience just in working with our clients, we want to be in the prevention business, right? We want to have more of a proactive approach. So just in thinking through how you're identifying what steps, what focus areas are in your audit, Make sure that you're thinking and just not taking for granted some of the really uh, basic pieces. Other areas you may want to consider under the hiring umbrella when it comes to your audit are job descriptions. So, and this would be really good. Also, if you are thinking about conducting the compensation and benchmarking salary analysis, you need to make sure your job descriptions are updated. In addition to, it's just a, a overall HR best practice and a win for your internal employees to know their expectations. But then related back to what I said earlier in regards to the FLSA, um, how are we categorizing? How are we classifying employees? Be looking at your job descriptions. Look at your job postings and advertisements, job application, the interview process, as we mentioned, reference checking process, and also offer letters. So I can tell you, I'm currently in South Carolina. The Department of Labor has very clear guidelines on what is required in a job offer letter for a candidate. So just be making sure that you know what is uh, required from a state perspective and any other, you know, HR, again, best practices. And then where do you put it? Right? Are you storing it correctly? Let's move on to the next slide. And it kind of goes hand in hand. And that's onboarding. So we're looking at onboarding employees. Oh, man. We want to make sure that companies have a very standard and consistent process when it comes to onboarding. I don't know if you know this, but uh, the companies that do have that experience 50% or greater new hire productivity. And like I mentioned, I'm all over the, the HR blogs and spending time in Sherm, but there are just so many articles linking to employee retention and, and linking it back to the onboarding process. This is absolutely critical. So thinking through your pre-employment pre screening, this should be included again in your audit uh, checklist process. So one thing that comes to mind here from an audit perspective is, are you uh, doing the appropriate release whenever candidates are, uh, you, you want to give a job offer and then a candidate has accepted, well, have they signed the appropriate release to conduct the background or drug screening? And then if someone does uh, fail, uh, they do not pass uh, the background or drug a screening process, however you've set that up, then are you doing the legally required releases for that process as well? How are you storing that documentation? And then just thinking through the new hire paperwork and employee files, as we discussed, I-9 forms and E-Verify. If I, if I just had a quarter for every employer that told me, yeah, yeah, we have I-9s, they're filled out correctly, I'm going to tell you, nine times out of 10, we are finding errors on the I-9 forms. And so, and it's not a gotcha moment. It's about, it's about again, preventing any sort of compliance violations and just making sure that we have accurate uh, record keeping. So we, we are here to help. Um, and then making sure you're, you're uh, according to your state and new hire reporting administration, you're doing it accordingly. The employee handbook. So when you're thinking about 
Um, and this also includes policies. So if you're thinking about your employee handbook, making sure you do have the appropriate policies, but also it's in um, adherence with uh, federal and state guidelines. So um, I know that I've even worked with some employment firms and they're smaller firms that, uh, you know, have shared their employee handbook. And I'm like, OK, well, we're going to we're going to go ahead and revamp that. Um, just again, not taking for granted the fact that, yes, um, two years ago, I had an attorney work on my employee handbook. Well, we want to make sure that um, you do have the proper revisions in place from a state and federal perspective, but also culturally, does it make sense with where you're moving forward with your business goals and um, how you're just looking at strategic HR initiatives? And then in addition to labor law posters, yep. They're still here. And guess what? I bet there are numerous updates from a state perspective. I know I've seen them in South Carolina and you may be seeing them in your state as well. So moving forward, uh, we're going to start talking about training. OK, so what is required and what is encouraged in your state? So there are currently six states that legally require sexual harassment training prevention, six states. Now, I'm just telling you, from an HR perspective, it is highly encouraged. I, I really encourage you to have harassment-free workplace training, and then make sure you're documenting that your employees have completed this training, and then also that it's actually been conducted and how often you're conducting this training as well. Um, again, from a prevention standpoint, it's the right thing to do. I think it's going to uh, make sure that you are um, putting yourself in a, in a great position to say, I am being proactive and making sure that I'm uh, attempting to prevent harassment in the workplace. So again, a major protection, but it's also improving your workplace culture. But think about and getting to know what are the other state requirements um, from training. So sometimes it's industry standards um, and, and what's required or certain positions, but getting to know that now and working with JER, we, you know, we do that legwork. But if you're an independent employer and you're, you're working on this yourself, um, it is your responsibility to research what is required and how often does it occur? How do you document? But that is something that is important to include in the HR audit. Next slide. When you're looking at this, uh, this final stage of the employment relationship is just managing employees. So thinking through from a consistency standpoint, um, Becky mentioned earlier in regards to leadership, are leaders trained appropriately? Well, um, do they know what would result in corrective action up to and including termination? How is HR influencing that? And, and uh, what does that relationship look like? The complaint reporting process. But is the corrective, act, corrective action form consistent? And again, where are you storing this information? Who has uh, accessibility to it? And performance reviews as well. So from performance review standpoint, um, be consistent. So one group and one department, and I, I actually see this a lot, they're receiving performance reviews because their manager is a bit more engaged than another manager, making sure that uh, you are consistent across the board from uh, the employee perspective and the performance review perspective. In regards to employment separation and terminations, of course, your employee files should be separated to terminated um, files and also your I-9 separated as well. But just in thinking through that some states require that you provide a termination letter. And some states actually say, hey, I'm, I'm going to give you the specific form that you need to provide an employee as they're exiting the business. Is your state included? That's what you need to know. Are you in compliance? Are you filling out the form? Are you filing it appropriately? And then like while we're on that topic, just thinking about the pay laws associated with terminated employees. So all of this, you could be checking. So we could be checking if it's a tangible document or if it's a process that you should be doing or should be encouraged um, in your organization moving forward. Next slide. If we revisit the poll, all right, bare minimum, we can eliminate the D, but it's how often do you conduct an internal HR audit? Just be thinking through, even from the things that we've covered today, and you know, we could probably talk about an audit and all things compliance related all day, but thinking through at least annually. And so whether that is uh, you know, outsourced or you're doing this internally, making sure that you are, are going through the appropriate pieces from an HR process perspective, HR best practices, but 
really from a compliance meets culture as well. All right, moving forward. This is the portion where we get really excited because we get to open it up and just be able to answer any of your questions and, and provide recommendations. And now, of course, we're going to say this from an HR perspective. These are just recommendations based on our experience and based on uh, what we've seen. So, um, Kayla, I want to switch it back to you. Yeah, thank you, Jada. And honestly, thank you so much uh, to Jada and Becky for this presentation. Uh, I swear, every time we do a webinar, I learn so much. Um, so I'm going to go down. We do have some questions in the Q&A. Um, I'm just going to kind of work our way down the list from top to bottom. Uh, let's see. Nathan says, do you have a helpful template spreadsheet to track uh, attrition? Is that something that um, I have? We might have that actually within our uh, delegate HR platform, possibly. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to address that. So um, people from, um, you know, uh, both uh, Willis and HRP, we have just released our Delegate HR, which is a platform that has been greatly expanded. So there is a turnover calculation sheet on that. Um, it has hundreds and hundreds of forms. We now have links to blogs, we have newsletters, things like that. So um, the website also comes with phone guidance. So if there's employers out there, they're like, I just don't know how much I really need. Um, we have three different memberships, one from two hours of service, one to four hours of uh, guidance, excuse me, guidance and service to six hours. And those are all annually. And we right. can talk, or, you know, we can definitely send you some information when we do the follow up with the link. Um, so yes, we do have a spreadsheet in our delegate HR, um, program. Awesome. Uh, Nathan, so just reach out to us. Um, the slide on the screen has, uh, Becky and Jada's email, uh, reach out to Becky. We can get you some more information on that template. Let's see. We have Miranda says, um, can you please clarify the training stage? Uh, I've always taken the approach that training is not a distinct stage and should be an ongoing process throughout the employment cycle. Absolutely. So we're taking this from a lens of just the audit perspective. So we can get into, again, it would take us days to get into each of these stages and what should be covered and how HR should be uh, collaborating, leading these efforts. But really, if you're thinking about training, it's just purely from an audit perspective. And so, for instance, even if it's not uh, federally required or required by the state, maybe it's something that you've set a goal of, of having my employees, you know, have a certain training each year. Well, are you doing it? So it's more of a checkpoint for you is, are you completing it? Are you following your own, you know, goals and initiatives? What goals do you want to set forward? And the other point I want to make is, if, if there is an area that is lacking, let's just say that you notice that your leaders are just really struggling with crucial conversations. Well, then you actually implement the fact that they're going to take a, a training once a year on crucial conversations, delivering difficult feedback. Well, you're basically just auditing the fact that has it been taken? Has everyone uh, passed the class? And um, also, is you know, there a check, to underst check for understanding? It makes sense. Thank you so much for your answer, Jada. Uh, let's see. Nathan says, if a job description is updated for a current employee, do we just send them the revised job description that's updated for them to review? So if a job description is updated for a current employee, do we just send them a revised? I, I would recommend that you would meet with the employee um, to discuss what has changed. If they're already aware of the changes, then yes, send it to uh, the employee to, to sign and acknowledge if that's, again, your process. But uh, if you are just changing the job description, um, I would have a face-to-face -face conversation and talk through and do a little bit more of a seek to understand uh, and explain the whys. Perfect. Uh, Tammy asks, where can we find what is required by state and federal? I think that I this was asked a few minutes ago whenever we were discussing um, that last bit, Jada. Yeah. yeah, I can take I can take this one. 
So um, you can go to the state, we always, you know, go to the State Department of Labor. Now, some states are great. They really provide incredible resources, a list of the, you know, a list of the laws. Um, other ones, you just have to do a little digging. So always go to the Department of Labor. Um, for the federal government, that's kind of a hit and miss too, because you have a lot of um, division, Department of Labor, EEOC, those types of things. So um, not to make this into a sales thing, but actually we do have a spreadsheet for federal laws in Delegate HR, and it actually shows, are you a public or private employer? Uh, how many employees do you have? And does this law apply to you? And the reason we created that is because even in HR, it was completely confusing. Like when did COBRA kick in? When did ADA kick in? When did, and so we created it as a tool for ourselves. So our clients uh, find it, you know, very valuable, but definitely start with the Department of Labor's and don't be afraid to call them to see if they have a resource that you're not able to find on the website. So do you have anything to add to that, Jada? No, I think it's perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much, Becky. Let's see. Uh, Nathan asked, in our audit, if we find an I-9 was completed incorrect incorrectly, what should we do? Should we have a tenured employee complete a new I-9? So my opinion on that is <laughs> it depends. I don't want to sound like an attorney. But um, so, for instance, what if it's a spelling error at the top in, in their name, you can do the option of cross off an initial um, as an updated version. Uh, however, uh, let's say that it's something uh, more so in the bottom, even from the employer section, or there are more than two errors, then I would recommend a completion um, of a new I-9 at that time. Um, and I would also recommend uh, attaching the previous I-9 just to make sure that, you know, you're showing that you've completed it initially, but this one has been updated. Um, also, <laughs> in the way of an audit, it's, it's quite a thorough process, but you're also um, putting a document in place, like writing it just in a Word document that says what has changed, what's been updated, and to go along with at the top of the, the folder to say an I-9 I audit has been conducted. Um, and this was the date and by whom. So answer is, it depends. Perfect. I do want to jump in on that just yeah. to um, let everybody know that um, they have now stopped the COVID flexibility. So people were able to check documents via remote. Um, that has been stopped. They've also given directive that for that period of time, if the employee is still active, you do need to go back and inspect their physical documents. Um, the only exception, or not only, it's not an exception, if you're an employer that uses e-verify, you can uh, re-verify or, you know, re-look at their documents uh, via uh, web, you know, via video. But everyone else, if they did not have e-verify and didn't have, you know, not just signing up for e-verify, -ver already had e-verify. So you do need to go and um, re-look physically at the documents of people you hired during that flexible period. So uh, we really do have some guidance on our delegate. We do have some guidance on our delegate HR because a lot of people are like, what's the question of, you know, I have employ all these remote employees now, I'm not going to be able to physically check them. And we've got some guidance for that on a document we have in Delegate HR. So. Perfect. Let's see our next question from Tammy. How do you do labor law postings if everyone works from home? <clears throat> I got it. Um, good question. So you have an external, usually you're having some type of document storage. So even if it's a, you know, Google Drive, whatever your intranet is, it has to be provided to each employee and have access to each, you know, employee. So easily accessible, how does your employee access uh, documents? And if you do not have any sort of uh, common storage that is accessible to your employees, then I want you to physically email it to every employee. Um, it's just making sure that the employee has accessibility, just like you would if there's a location, because you have to put it in a spot that all employees, would. it's a high traffic area. Hopefully that makes sense. Yes, perfect. 
Um, and if I could add to that, um, I am not HR, but as someone who is, uh, I do project coordination here, and as someone who takes care of a lot of the posters for our clients, um, there are poster services out there that can take care of it for you. But like Jada said, the easiest way is to just have that those posters within your own internet. Uh, let's see. And our last question over here is from George. And he says, is your group able to conduct an audit if we decide to go externally to get our audits done? Absolutely. Most definitely. Do you like that? So <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I'll, great I'll, I'll expand on that a little bit, too. Is, yeah, um, please. Oh, go ahead. Uh, like Jada had mentioned, it's customized too. So we just don't have this, you know, um, this is what you're going to get. We do a really good discovery conversation and determine what areas that you, that's most important to you and your organization and your goals. So yes, we've been doing them a long time and we're great at them. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we haven't had any other questions come into the chat. Um, if you guys do have any other questions um, up on the screen, you see Jada and Becky's information have been up there. You can reach out to us anytime um, to ask those questions. Thank you again for joining us this Friday uh, to discuss HR audits of all things. <laughs> we hope that everyone has a wonderful weekend and thank you again to our magnificent presenters and and I hope everybody has a great day.